today's scripture passage comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, the first ten verses. And if you are looking at the Bibles in your pews, you can find that on pages 1549 and 1550. Listen to the word of the Lord as it is read. After the Sabbath, at dawn on that first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The darts were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Imagine being one of the disciples during that first holy week. And when I'm saying disciples, I mean anybody who's following. So I'm not talking just the 12 that we often think of. But just think that you were following Jesus that last week. What a week it had been. Things were going magnificent last Sunday. Jesus rides into Jerusalem and was serenaded with shouts of Hosanna to the Son of David, along with cries of blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He even then changed out the money, uh, chased out the money chaser, or changers from the temple those despicable people who made an unjust profit by selling animals for sacrifice and also charging a high uh, interest rate to change our currency into the local currency. Our Lord was even so, uh, so angry with them, he called them a den of thieves. Sure, in the middle of the week there were some debates between Jesus and the temple leaders. But that's nothing out of the ordinary. That happened all the time. Then came Thursday night. Things started to get strange. When no arrangements were made to have a servant available to wash the disciples' feet at feet as they came in to celebrate the Seder meal, Jesus humbled himself and did the task, a task that was always assigned to the lowest servant in the household. Then, at the meal himself, itself, he declared that one of us was going to be trained. He even talked about how the bread was his body broken for us, and his blood was the wine being poured out to form a new covenant. Later that night, indeed, Judas came, and he betrayed Jesus to the officials. Those officials arrested him, and the Sanhedrin held a trial in the middle of the night 
even though it was against the law and the Torah to do so. They found him guilty and handed him over to Pilate to be crucified. That Friday, Pilate tried to save Jesus, but when he offered up Jesus to be the one released during his annual Passover tradition of pardoning one of the prisoners, the crowd yelled that they wanted Barabbas, a murderer and a rabble rouser. Fearful of the crowd, Pilate handed over Jesus to be flogged and then crucified, and he indeed re released Barabbas. We thought Jesus was the Messiah. Yet, apparently, we were wrong. After all, Deuteronomy declares in chapter 21, verse 23, that anyone who is hung on a tree, and a cross qualified for that, but anyone who hung on a tree was cursed. There is no way a person who died a death in that manner could be the Messiah, could he? As I stop here, I just try to imagine what the followers of Jesus must have been going through as they spent the night sleeping on uh, what we call Good Friday, and then spent all day that Saturday wondering what now. All their hopes, all their expectations, apparently dead on the cross. Matthew, when he picks up the story in chapter 28, begins with the two Marys waking up in the pre-dawn hours of Sunday morning and making a journey to the tomb, presumably to stand vigil there. Mark and Luke has a slightly different story. They have other women joining uh, the two Marys, and they claim that they were bringing uh, herbs and spices to finish preparing Jesus' body for burial. John's Gospel doesn't have anybody but Mary Magdalene going to the tomb. But like Matthew's story, Mary didn't bring anything. She was just going to stand vigil. Matthew then reports something that none of the other uh, Gospels report. As the two Marys were going to the tomb, there was a great earthquake as a result of an angel coming down from heaven to roll away the stone. And then after the stone was rolled away, he sat on it. Upon seeing this, the guards who were at the tomb shook in fear and became like dead men. Think about this for a moment. Battle-hardened soldiers being so scared that they become like dead men at the sight of just one angel. One of the commentaries I read the last couple of weeks had an interesting quote about this situation. The quote is, the ones who were assigned to guard the dead themselves appeared to be dead dead, while the dead one was made alive. In verses 5 through 7, the angel greets the two Marys and declares that Jesus had been risen from the dead. He then instructs the ladies to go quickly and tell the disciples that the Lord had been risen from the dead and that they were to go back to Galilee where the Lord is headed. Jesus, earlier in the week, told the disciples that indeed he would be executed, but that he would rise three days later and he would be reunited with them in Galilee. Yet all of the chaos that took place that Thursday and Friday made the disciples seem to have forgotten 
like Jesus had told them. Verse 8 reports that the two ladies departed from the tomb with great fear and joy. Now, it may seem strange that fear is being combined with joy here. But as I thought about it, I flashed back to a vacation that I took with my family back when my two children were elementary school age, I think, maybe a little older. We were at Knott's Berry Farm, and they had a ride called the Supreme Screen. My younger daughter had always wanted to have go on a ride. We had uh, tickets to an amusement park in the Bay Area, or a season pass, actually. And they had a 40-foot free fall drop. But Sarah, unfortunately, was just a little too small to meet the height requirement. The Supreme Screen with its 200-foot free fall drop, however, Sarah hit the line right on the line. She wanted to go on the ground. I thought, sure, why not? As we started going up that ride, 40 feet, not too bad. 100 feet, hmm, this is a little bit fun. As we get to about 150 feet, I look over at Sarah, and I'm sure glad that they had the uh, seats belted in so she could have just jumped in fear. And I have to admit that as we sat and I could see the landscape at 200 feet, I realized, wait a minute, I'm the one who's afraid to climb up ladders because I don't want to fall. At about that time, the ride fell and I had this sense of fear but I also had this sense of, this is kind of fun. I think the two Marys had that fear-joy mixture. They were fearful because, okay, dead Jesus writes, what happens next? After all, I'm sure, just like none of us have any plans for what to do if somebody who we know has been buried shows up on our doorstep, we wouldn't know what to do. I'm sure the disciples weren't quite sure what to do when they figured out Jesus was alive. And while they were fearful, they still had the joy of, hey, the cross was not the end of the story. As, they, as the two ladies returned on their way back to inform the disciples, they came across Jesus himself. He greets the two ladies, and they immediately fall to the ground, clasp his feet, and worship him. Now, those of us who were here during the season of Lent, might remember our sermon series on 1 Corinthians 15. And during that sermon series, we saw that Paul emphasized the importance of the resurrection of the body. Here in verse 9, we see evidence that indeed Jesus was physically resurrected. It wasn't that his spirit was resurrected, because if it was just a spirit, as soon as the two Marys grabbed his feet, their hands would go right through it. Jesus was physically uh, resurrected. We, too, can look forward to the day when our earthly mortal bodies will be transformed into a physical, imperishable body. Our passage ends this morning with Jesus repeating what the angel said to the two men. They were to fear not 
and go tell the disciples to get themselves to Galilee, where they would see the Lord. In Matthew's resurrection account, we see the two Marys being told what to do, and they obeyed the command. In this, act, in this action, I see an application point for each of us. What has our Savior told us to do? Is there some specific task through the that we have been told through the Holy Spirit that we're supposed to do? If we know what that task is, are we doing it? If not, why not? I think about when I heard God saying, go to seminary. I was like, no way, Lord. <laughs> Seminary requires me to take Greek and Hebrew. I barely passed Spanish too in high school, and the only reason why I passed that was Mrs. Pachoto did not have the courage to give me the F that I deserved because I was such a good young uh, student at that time, so she gave me the D. How am I going to pass Greek and Hebrew? Eventually, God made it so terrible for me that I went, okay, Lord, I'll go and try uh, passing Greek and Hebrew, and if I pass Greek and Hebrew, I'll take that as the sign. Needless to say, I did pass Greek and Hebrew, otherwise I wouldn't be here right now. But when we disobeyed the Lord, he has a way of making it clear that he's not happy with that. It's okay to be scared because even once I signed up for seminary, I'm like, gee, I have to pay for seminary. I have two daughters who in three or four years will be in college. <laughs> you know, I had all these questions and God said, just go. I had a friend tell me, it's like driving a car without power steering. If you're standing still, it's impossible to move the steering wheel. But if you're moving, even if you're going in the wrong direction, it's easier to turn the car if you're moving. I would say, if you know what the Lord is telling you to do, do it. We can, he can correct the course as we are moving. If you're not sure if God has given you a specific task, I think Matthew 28 issues a standing order. At the end of chapter 28, in verses 19 and 20, we are told to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I command them. Then he gives them a promise, the promise being that he will be with us always, even to the end of the age. Whether we know what that one task is or not, we all have been given at least one task by the Lord. As we take time today to celebrate our risen Savior, let us renew our efforts to be faithful to the task or the task that we have been given. Let us do all of those tasks with great joy, knowing that as we fulfill our charge, our Lord is with us, even to the ends of the earth. Amen.